Colleagues, good afternoon. We're happy to welcome all of you today. We are um, currently conducting the concluding press conference in view of the upcoming general shareholders meeting of PGC Gazprom. Our last press conference is, as usual, dedicated to the finance and economic policy of Gazprom. We have uh, Mr. Femil Sadigov, Deputy Chairman of the Management Committee, Mr. Karen Oganyan, Head of Department, and Deputy Head of Department and Head of Division, Mr. Alexei Finikov. Over to Mr. Sadigov uh, for the presentation, and then we'll be happy to take your questions. Mr. Sadigov. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I understand. Uh, we are in touch uh, with you more or less frequently, and you know me, but nonetheless, let me introduce myself. I'm Famil Sadigov, Deputy Chairman of the Management Committee, and I'm in charge of the Finance and Economic Block of PGC Gazprom. I'll be happy to present the finance and economic elements of Gazprom operations. We have prepared a few slides for you. So here's the deck, and I will be happy to comment, starting with page two, please. Yeah. 2020 saw the perfect storm in the global commodity and energy markets lasting from April until June. The causes thereof are well known, starting with lockouts or lockdowns and other measures to respond to COVID-19 pandemic resulted in lower demand for natural gas and oil. Sometimes it was abnormally low. On top of the pandemic, the discrepancies between members of the OPEC plus agreements about its extension further aggravated the situation. At the end of March 2020, once the uh, previous agreement expired, oil production went up and the prices correspondingly went down to record lows in the global energy markets. Thirdly, the winter of 2019 and 2020 was abnormally warm. The ambient temperature in Europe, on the average, was three degrees higher than multi-year average. For obvious reasons, this constrained the growth of demand for gas in Europe, while lower demand has resulted in effect to excessive inventories in underground storages. As of March 2020, underground storages in Europe were 60% full, which is 1.5 times higher than the five-year uh, average for March. Fourthly, LNG supplies carried on with their deliveries, even though they were incurring significant losses and that resulted in a um, significant oversupply of gas in Europe. As a result, based on the uh, reasons explained, May 2020 saw the lowest gas price in European hubs across the 25-year period. The minimal price was as low as $30 and even less than $30 per thousand cubic meters, which is three times lower than the price as at, at the beginning of 2020. Proceeding to page three, the extraordinary circumstances described were the most complex stress tests for the financial position of Gazprom. We can now confidently say that we have lived through that challenge successfully, first and foremost, thanks to our conservative financial policy. Please be reminded that Gazprom's budget for 2020 had a significant reserve fund or cushion in the amount of 700 or actually six. Um, 196.7 billion rubles. This liquidity could allow us to finance all of our liabilities without any adjustments of the budget. However, we understood how grave the situation was and we understood the risks as well. Throughout the year, we carried out monthly analysis of our income and expenses line by line and updated the budget accordingly. That effort covered not only the budget of PGC Gazprom, but also its sub-holdings, such as Gazprom Neft, Gazprom Energa Holding, and Gazprom Mezregion Gas. Their budgets uh, were under strict control with a strict focus on cost optimization. That approach resulted in very positive results in a crisis environment and serves as a foundation for longer term improved efficiency of our budgeting. In 2020, we carried on our effort to um, centralize cash flows and liquidity. Uh, by the end of 2020, the uniform cash pooling system covered 582 companies of the group, while the consolidated liquidity pool exceeded 720 billion rubles. A single settlement center and uh, the single cash pooling system for Gazprom Group allowed us to be more efficient in distributing the cash flows and reduce external debt brought in by the subsidiaries. 
Another major tool uh, was bank supervision of the group's contracts. Fully-fledged rollout of this instrument allows us to be efficient in controlling the cost of Gazprom Group when paying to third parties. With all these tools being important, nonetheless, our main response to the external challenge was about reduced OPEX and CAPEX. I would like to dwell upon that in greater detail. Gazprom Group's operating expenses in 2020 stood at $79 billion, or 20% less than in 2019. We paid special attention to ensure that a production plan remains in place and a reliability of gas supplies does not suffer against the backdrop of lower costs. We have managed to save on procurement of oil and gas from third parties. On top of that, we reduced costs across a broad line, um, a broad list of administrative and managerial cost lines heat supply and geological exploration. We did not cost, however, taxes, payroll, social payments, insurance, and pandemic-related expenses, or COVID-related. In the circumstances, we optimized not only the OPEX, but also the CAPEX side of the business. The group's CAPEX in 2020 was 21 billion US dollars, or 26% less in, than in most significant cut of six billion dedicated to the gas business. I would like to optim I would like to underline the fact it we're talking here about optimization rather than a simple cutting. We manage nonetheless to ensure that the projects are delivered on time. When shaping our budget for 2021, we set the new limits in line with the results already achieved from the cost-cutting exercise of 2020. Page five, let me explain the tax side of the business. Please direct your attention to the fact that the company maintains its status as a major taxpayer despite the major drop in global energy prices in 2020. Tax payments by Gazprom Group stood at 2.4 trillion rubles, while the MET and export duties went down because of lower oil and gas prices, while the excise payments went up on the oil side of the business. We kept implementing a project to minimize uh, the tax risk on our counterparty side. That's why we have tax reservations in our agreements with counterparties to stimulate timely execution of their tax liabilities. Thus, we significantly reduce or minimize the financial loss risk on the Gazprom side. The Federal Tax Service is happy to see that. On top of that, we are doing tax monitoring project with the Federal uh, taxes uh, service uh, targets better transparency of Gazprom Group. We uh, deliver data to the Federal Tax Service online in real time, which allows us to uh, reduce the company's financial risks and streamline our cooperation with the tax authorities. Uh, this rollout is gradual. As of now, 24 uh, subsidiaries of Gazprom Group are enrolled in the project. By 2022, we are going to have more than 70% of total tax payments within the consolidated group of taxpayers as Gazprom Group. In 2022 onwards, we are going to add 12 more companies onto the list. This efficient mechanism would uh, be effective for 36 major organizations in key operations of Gazprom's business. Proceeding to page six. The financial results in 2020 turned out to be better than the key numbers in our adjusted budgets and exceeded expectations of most analysts. The revenue stood at 88 billion US dollars, the EBITDA at 20.4 billion US dollars. These numbers have allowed us to finance all of our projects planned, and our liquidity position remains strong. The amount of deposits and cash and cash equivalences at the end of the year stood at $14.2 billion, which is 1.5 times higher than the short-term debt. Most of the EBITDA contribution comes from the gas business, with $53 billion US in revenue and $10 billion on the EBITDA. 
The second uh, most significant segment of Gazprom Group is the oil business, generating nearly six billion U.S. dollars of EBITDA. In the volatile environment of 2020, the utilities business played a major role as well, contributing sustainably at 1.5 billion U.S. dollars into our EBITDA and a free cash flow of more than 400 million U.S. dollars. Clearly, it was unavoidable to. Um, see the financial numbers dropping in 2020, while the rate of decline on the revenue and the bidar side of Gazprom's business were more moderate than with the other oil and gas majors. This comes thanks to the competitive edge of Gazprom and timely response to improve our financial performance and also a well-balanced structure of the group's business. Proceeding to page 7. Admittedly, our leverage in 2020 went up, so the net debt to EBITDA ratio exceeded the comfort range. As at the end of 2020, it stood at 2.6 times. Moreover, through, throughout the year, there was a real threat uh, that the leverage would exceed the ceiling of 3.0, and in order to address that, we um, took preventive action. First and foremost, we managed to avoid uh, a further EBITDA decline through a systemic effort on the cost cutting and also through ex increasing export volumes in a better pricing environment of the second half in 2020. Secondly, we have a limited traditional loans. Um, reducing the size by 129 billion as compared to the initial plan. Thirdly, October 2020 saw Gazprom uh, placing perpetual bonds, the first company to do so in the CIS. Please be reminded that IFRS rules prescribe that perpetual bonds are accounted for as equity 100 percent, thus not increasing the uh, leverage. We had perpetual bond issue earned the amount of 1.4 billion US dollars and 1 billion euro thus contributing a third of the total borrowing plan for 2020. In 2021, we are going to carry on with this practice. In March, in March, uh, the uh, Central Bank of Russia registered our uh, perpetual bond program for the amount of 150 billion rubles. The first issue is to take place this month. The proceeds will be streamed to finance the gas infrastructure expansion program in Russian regions. And government is going to support us uh, in paying the coupon. Our efforts towards project financing also contributed to lower leverage of 2020. In August last year, we uh, closed a deal for project financing dedicated to the second stage of Yuzhnaruski field in the amount of 40 billion rubles. In 2021, we had 70 billion rubles of project financing closed for Simakovsky field. In the future, we're going to use this instrument to finance development of our own fields and those that we develop with our strategic partners, such as the Tambe field, which we jointly develop with Ruskas de Beche, Lajavorskaya and Vainiviska, which we work on with Lukoil, and Uringoiska, which we're developing together with Winters Haledia from Germany. 2022 is going to see completion of project financing for our gas processing complex in Ustluga. Our net debt to be done target for 2021 is lower than two, and I'm proud to say that as at the end of Q1, we are nearly there. Let's take a look at page eight. Q1 2021 was extremely positive for Gazprom, benefiting from the upward upturn that uh, started in the second half of 2020. Starting from the autumn last year, the gas market is demonstrating very fast recovery, exceeding expectations of most analysts. The growth of natural gas prices in Europe is explained by um, high demand because of uh, cold weather mostly and also because LNG has been funneled towards Asia. As a result, our Q1 revenue on the group's level stood uh, at a high number, 31 percent higher than in previous year. Our EBITDA was also high at 701 billion rubles, second largest in the company's history. On top of that, we had a record quarterly net income of 447 billion rubles. Our CAPEX remained flat uh, year on year. 
which reflects our intent to maintain the 2021 CAPEX at a figure somewhat higher than 2020. And we expect that the group's CAPEX is going to be at around 1.5, 1.6 trillion rubles. The free cash flow of Q1 stood at 468 billion rubles. This has allowed us to reduce the net debt for the quarter by $6.4 billion. The lower net debt and the higher EBITDA has contributed to much improved leverage of net debt to EBITDA, which went down to 2.1, which uh, is pretty much adjacent to the comfort range being our target for 2021. Gazprom's policy to maintain a liquidity cushion proved efficient last year when we successfully lived through the most challenging uh, year in a decade. I'm talking about challenges for the oil and gas business. And uh, starting from 2021, we increased the liquidity cushion available to $20 billion, which is nearly 2.5 times higher than the short-term debt, guaranteeing that we can pay no problem. The positive uh, forecast of uh, free cash flows for 2021 has allowed the board of directors to recommend paying dividend of 50 percent of the adjusted net income based on the results of 2020 and the amount of 297 billion rubles or 12.55 rubles per share. This is the largest dividend for um, all Russian oil and gas companies based on the results of 2020. Thus, we are one year early in hitting our uh, dividend payout target as prescribed by the dividend policy. This fact serves to prove that the growth of dividend payouts to our shareholders remains the priority for Gazprom's management team. Please note the role of the so-called non-cash items in defining the dividend base. Our net income in 2020 stood at 135 billion rubles, while the adjusted net income uh, was higher at 594 billion rubles, mostly because of the adjustment by FX losses. Comparing these numbers explains how efficient our adjustment mechanism is as prescribed by the dividend policy. I would like to repeat that our results of Q1 2021 uh, has contributed a lot into further dividend payments based on the full year of 2021. We had a good net income of 447 billion rubles, which is several times higher than the full year's net income of 2020. The dividend base um, calculation stands at 391 billion rubles based on the first quarter loan. The uh, dividend policy prescribes that from 2021 onwards, we are committed to pay no less than 50% of adjusted net income, and we're definitely going to stick to that rule looking forward. To conclude, I would like to market that the improved market environment has already been reflected in Gazprom's share price and of the recent months. Nonetheless, we are confident that uh, there is a major upside for Gazprom shares a similar opinion is shared by many investment analysts who maintain their recommendation to buy gas from stock and regularly uh, increase the target price for gas from shares. Uh, page 10 gives you an overview of Gazprom's investment highlights split into three groups. One is about the competitive advantages of Gazprom. This, uh, these allow us to maintain leadership in the European market and ramp up deliveries to the promising market of China. This allows us to benefit from the favorable oil and gas market situation to improve the company's financials. Secondly, we're talking about a strong financial performance of uh, uh, Gazprom, which is defined by our conservative financial policy. Following through on that policy has allowed us to live through 2020 without any major increase on leverage, but also ensure paying the dividend of 50% of adjusted net income as early as 2021, based on the results of 2020, which is one year early than prescribed by the dividend policy. In the future, we intend to pay dividend from the free cash flow, which is also going to prove the resilience of our financial position. 
Finally, uh, we're talking about the pillar of sustainable development underlying Gazprom's operations. Every year, we reinforce our ESG efforts and understand this abbreviation does not need to be explained. Everyone is aware of that. So our efforts are reflected in an uh, international ranking. In particular, the high position we gained in the CDP ranking. On top of that, we have approved a sustainable development policy uh, uh, calculating various low carbon development scenarios by the year of 2050. We are confident that these drivers and the positive market environment in the oil and gas markets are going to be reflected in the market cap of Gazprom. Thank you for your attention. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. Sadegov. We are ready to proceed um, with the Q&A session. Colleagues, uh, let us agree that everyone pays uh, two or three questions max so that um, everyone has a chance. Starting with Dina Hrenikova Bloomberg. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Sadego. Good afternoon, colleagues. I have a couple of questions just to clarify and one uh, full question, so to say. You have mentioned in your presentation that you intend to get your net debt EBITDA to below two based on the results of 2021. Do you have any more specific guidance, maybe? And I understand you would like to maintain your um, leverage on a conservative level. How would you like to balance dividend payout, which is going to be higher than based on the full year of 2020, and the conservative leverage? How are you going to balance these targets? And finally, a question on your bond issues, um, plans like uh, Eurobonds. Are they coming this year? Uh, what are your targets for this year? Thank you. What are the amounts? Thank you, Dina. You look so good. Haven't seen you for ages. But anyway, um, that's a very good question. Um, and managing um, our debt has always been the Gazprom's, uh, the focus of Gazprom, especially after the crisis of 2020, when uh, the leverage uh, stood at 2.6 times at the end of the year. This is too high for us, going beyond the comfort range. Um, our target for 2021 suggests that the budget, the budget would have um, the the number of about two. That's our target. That's the plan. However, considering the positive evolution of the oil and gas markets in the past five months, and our good numbers in Q1, we expect. Uh, much uh, improved financial situation and uh, the financial metrics. Starting with EBITDA, our EBITDA is set to increase by 50% year on year. So we intend to hit three, uh, zero, 30 billion US dollars. Uh, sorry, 300. And um, then we believe that um, hybrid instruments are going to affect um, our performance as well. On top of uh, perpetual bond issues last year, we intend to have uh, a perpetual bond in rubles for 150 billion rubles in total. This money will be used to finance the gas infrastructure expansion program. So uh, that project is going to be financed not from our CAPEX, not from our EBITDA, not from new debt either. Uh, in terms of total debt, we intend to reduce the company's total debt by the end of the year. In my presentation, I have explained um, that is our intent. Most likely, it will happen. So, uh, as uh, early as the end of this year, we'll get into the comfort area of 1.6 to 1.8 um, times in terms of net debt to be done. Now, um, our expectations on the dividend side. Was that your question? Diana, do I get you right? Please help me. Um, my question is about how you are going to balance uh, major dividend payout and uh, reducing your leverage. 
What's your tactics? Well, um, 2020 was a crisis year, clearly demonstrating it to us we need to balance um, to find a sweet spot, and uh, we do intend to pay 50% of uh, net income as dividend, as prescribed by the dividend policy. We intend to pay that from the free cash flow while maintaining the FCF in the positive area so that we don't increase the, the leverage. That's the basic principle underlying our operations for three, at least three years to come, and uh, that is reflected in our uh, prospective three-year budget. Now, responding to the last bit of your questions, I was asking about uh, the bonds, uh, including Eurobond plans for this year. In 2021, our borrowing plan uh, has 511 billion as the target. It's part of our budget. Looking at the markets and looking at our operating results allow us uh, not to implement the borrowing plan in full. Most likely, we're going to have 100 billion less. That's the borrowing side. Um, with perpetual bonds, yes, we do intend to follow through on that as well. We are going to have a few issues upcoming in the nearest future as to the currencies and uh, the timeline. Well, uh, we'll see how the markets perform. We'll see the pricing, we'll see the volumes, we'll see the currencies. We are considering an issue in the euro and the dollar and also in the Swiss franc. Dina? Yes, thank you. If you uh, uh, comment on the potential issue of perpetual bonds, uh, which is due this week, I'll be very thankful. Maybe other colleagues say uh, something about it. Well, sure, if uh, our moderator allows, let me say a few words on that. Of course, we are placing euro bonds uh, with the target of 30 billion. Uh, we'll see how the market responds. And obviously, we target uh, financial institutions and uh, private pension funds. So far, as we hear from the, the, the book runners, uh, it's going quite good. I don't think I can disclose anything further. I simply can't. The first issue is to take place in the nearest future, and uh, we'll uh, use up uh, all the 150 billion by the end of the year. I have absolutely no doubt it's uh, going to happen. Thank you, Dina. Our next question is coming from Olga Vidyaeva, TAS. Good afternoon. I have a question um, adjacent to the subject of perpetual bonds. Do I get it right that the first tranche of 30 billion uh, rubles is coming this uh, week uh, because I'm a little bit confused. You're speaking about the euro. And what's the purpose uh, of the proceeds? Uh, only the gas infrastructure expansion or any other project? And who could be buying these securities? Thank you. Thanks. Indeed, uh, we have made this decision. The board of directors has endorsed that decision as well. And we have clearance from the Central Bank of Russia. So as of now, we are involved in uh, some organizational efforts, uh, studying the markets, and possibly next week we could tap it. The total amount is 150 billion for the year. As endorsed, all of that amount will be streamed or funneled towards the gas infrastructure expansion program, as explained by Gazprom early on in the year. We suggested that the gas infrastructure expansion program will be financed uh, with the help of perpetual bonds in rubles. Please be reminded that the um, CAPEX related to that program stands at 526 billion rubles, covering the years of 2021 through 2025. So that's about 105 billion every year. So uh, for year one, however, the costs are a little bit 
higher, so we are thinking of 150 billion rubles. That's the hybrid tool we'll be using. We'll be buying it. Well, uh, indeed, um, legislation has been passed recently to allow retail investors in, but we are mostly looking towards institutional investors, financial organizations, as well as public and private pension funds. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is coming from RBC. Ms. Ludmila Podobedova, please go ahead. Good afternoon. Please hold a sec. Ludmila, I'm very happy to see you here so much of you, but we didn't come across uh, too very often, uh, too often. Please don't, don't, don't be too nervous. Go ahead with your question. I'm here for you. Thank you. Here's my question. Have you had any change of plans um, on the borrowing side once the gas infrastructure expansion program has been fully endorsed? Are you going to have any um, adjustments in financing? And my other question is about your dividend for 2021, or based on the results of 2021. The presentation explains there will be a major upside, but uh, what's the expectation? Any guidance here? Thank you. Indeed, our uh, borrowing plan um, has been improved in the amount of 511 billion rubles. That's our borrowing budget for 2021. However, as explained, based on the current market situation and our potential capabilities, we uh, may not uh, run that program in full. So far, our plan is to leave 100 billion, so only place one, uh, 411 billion. The gas infrastructure expansion plan, well, in 2021, we are financing all of the program with the perpetual bond issue in rubles. The proceeds will be used to expand the gas infrastructure in Russian regions. Again, we are not financing that from the company Zabida. We are not bringing in additional debt. The gas infrastructure expansion plan is not going to affect our, our debt. Now, responding to your other question on the dividends. As of now, um, it's too early to make any forecasts. I have mentioned that our EBITDA is expected to be $30 billion for the full year. Our net income, well, uh, given these adjustments, which is mostly FX, it's rather challenging to make a precise prediction. Most probably will be a better position to answer this question in September this year when we um, fix our budget. I'll be able to tell you the net income expected by the end of the year, and then you can divide it by two and get the dividend. It's very easy, 50% payout. The adjustments are very straightforward as well, very transparent. You know that uh, many investors, all of the banks were involved in, in devising our dividend policy. The rules are very straightforward, so these calculations come easy. It's very transparent. Um, and then the government has decided uh, on 50 percent of adjusted net income as of recently, which is uh, in line with our dividend policy uh, as uh, it approved uh, 18 months ago. Thank you. Our next question is coming from uh, Tatiana Dietl, Commerçant. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. I have a question on project financing for Ust Luga. When do you intend to bring in the funding? What's the volume and who the money could be coming from? Another question relates to Nord Stream 2, uh, whether Gazprom still intends to bring in project financing for Nord Stream 2, and a very quick uh, question about the liquidity cushion of 700 billion. Would you like to release that provision or would you rather increase it? And uh, uh, what are you going to need the money for in the future? How are you going to spend it? Thank you. Okay. Tatiana, 
Uh, let me double check something with you. Uh, project financing for Ustluga, Nord Stream 2, and the liquidity cushion, correct? Yes. Uh, let me start with the last one. Starting with um, the provision. I wouldn't call it provision, by the way. It's the reserve fund. Uh, releasing the reserve fund? Uh, no, we do not intend to release it. That's my answer to you up front. Back in 2020, that was the case as well. The reserve fund is there for the company to meet its liabilities in a crisis situation. When running our stress testing exercises, we defined the volume of the reserve fund, like why we had 696.7 billion rather than 700 billion for 2020, because of our stress test exercise back in 2019. We understood that's the amount we'd be needing in a crisis environment. That's why we had it in our budget for 2020. In the following years, uh, that practice will remain in place, for sure. I can tell you that at the end of 2020, we uh, still did not use up the reserve fund in full, but rather had 600 billion remaining, 616, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, that is going to remain in place, but releasing the reserve, well, it's not a provision, right? It's a reserve fund for, uh, in case of a crisis. And again, uh, you must understand the size of our balance sheet. This is not a very material amount. That's uh, only our expense or our cost side for two months. So we can afford, really, to have that kind of a reserve fund. On the other hand, that's a great tool to uh, manage our leverage. 2020 has proven it. Even if we have a nice liquidity on hand, um, even when we had nice liquidity on hand, um, we still had an issue with liquidity, and we managed to uh, regulate that thanks to our cash and cash equivalents. So um, quick answer to you then? No, we do not intend to release it. Um, over to your other question about uh, project financing in Ustluga. Um, yes, we do intend to launch it. We have the project company well in place uh, with uh, all the advisors and uh, uh, bankers on hand, with the legal teams working, with uh, environmental uh, due diligence, and obviously the financial advisor, VEB and Gazprom Bank. Um, VEB and GPB are working or to finalize the model and understand uh, the capacity for project financing. The target is rather uh, ambitious, of uh, nearly 80%. But um, realistically speaking, it's going to be 30 versus 70 percent split. The classical element, 30 percent equity, 70 percent project financing. As soon as the financial models are ready, um, we're going to have an investor presentation and uh, take your questions on the amounts, the volumes, and uh, the currencies whether it's going to be a domestic issue or international issue, whether we'll have export agencies supporting the plan. We're going to revert to your question in a short while. Now, uh, project financing for Nord Stream 2. Well, uh, my quick answer to you is no. We do not intend to bring in any project financing for Nord Stream 2. But I can tell you that project, uh, the project Nord Stream 2 uh, has full financing already available, so we're ready to conclude the project phase and start running it. At the same time, the project uh, is under significant pressure, so we cannot comment uh, in any great detail. All the information is disclosed by the project operator, Nord Stream 2 AG. But my answer to you, no, we do not intend to bring in project financing for it. In the future, we may uh, want to raise some debt with a bond issue, but that's a very distant future. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Thanks. And our next question is coming from Oksana Kobzova, Reuters. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Can you hear me? Yep. And we can see you, too. Uh, good. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Sedigov. Uh, I have a quick follow-up on Nord Stream 2, if I may. 
You have suggested that the project has full financing allocated. I'm wondering if Gazprom has ramped up its portion of the financing because the uh, European partners have allocated a lower amount of funding as compared to the initial plan. Why so? Is that in any way related to the stronger euro vis-a-vis -vis the ruble, uh, or rather the weaker uh, ruble vis-a-vis -vis the euro, and uh, you're getting the same amount in rubles, hence lower amount in euro? And my other question, can you advise how much revenue you got from your sales to China back in 2020, and what's your target for 2021? And then, if I may, another general question on the market. Gazprom has long had plans to uh, get another listing elsewhere, uh, potentially in Asia. I'm wondering if you have any further update uh, on those plans, or are you only focused on the Moscow Exchange, where you're currently listed? Do you uh, consider the possibility for a secondary offering on the Moscow Exchange? Thank you. Okay. Oksana. Uh, uh, I uh, think I've heard three questions, but please help me. Uh, question about Nord Stream 2, okay. Then China, and then the listing, right? Yep. And in a, or an SPO potentially. Okay, uh, let's start from the back uh, with an SPO. I hear from time to time some suggestions about an SPO. I'm getting questions about it. Whether uh, um, an additional issue, some preference shares potentially. Or anything related to the gas infrastructure expansion program? Um, no. Uh, frankly, uh, we do not see that as an issue. It's not on our agenda at all. And we simply don't see the need. It has never come to our minds. So uh, my answer to all of the three questions, no. No, we do not plan an SPO. No, we are not planning any additional issue. And uh, no, we are not planning any issue of preference stock. On the listing venue, uh, well, colleagues, I consider a listing um, in the context of bringing in new investors. And I believe that there is a good opportunity to bring in investors otherwise, other than an additional listing. Even in the pandemic year of 2020, we had 76 76 meetings with investors. We had an investor day. We uh, met uh, regularly. We have discussed. So uh, that allows us to bring in new investors. And secondly, uh, as we showcase our operational performance, we bring in more investors um, as compared to a new listing venue. Indeed, a decision was made a while back to attempt another listing, potentially, and we had um, some of the treasury shares we, we intended to sell. So we considered bringing in new investors. But as you are aware, we have successfully sold the uh, treasury shares very recently, and we are very happy because we used our exchange to do so. Um, so we, we do not have any uh, listing plans as of now, although expanding the investor base is our key objective for the few years to come. We would like to gain some trust and expand the list of investors geographically. Um, and not only geographically, we would like to bring in more trust from the current investors with additional limits coming from them. Now, uh, over to your uh, still another question on uh, Nord Stream 2. I'm uh, not sure where you're getting these numbers as to who's paying more, who's paying less, what the original plan was or so. I can tell you one thing. All the planned amounts have been uh, paid and used by the project. That's uh, it in a nutshell. And one final question of yours regarding China. Ms. Elena Burmistrova had a press conference as well, so I'm sure uh, 
she got these questions and, uh, and then she spoke on that uh, at the investor day. And so last year we delivered 4.1 billion cubic meters of gas to China. 2021 has 8.5 billion cubic meters as the target. Um, on the revenue side, however, it was 44.3 billion rubles last year. This year we intend to have two times the amount. That's it for China. Um, and indeed, uh, we have a contract with the Chinese side with a confidentiality agreement attached, so we cannot disclose the numbers without involving our partners. Obviously, you understand that. A quick follow-up, then, um, if I may. Yes, please go ahead. Do you uh, have any specific plans in relation to Novatech shares owned by the group? What are you going to do with the shares? Yep, uh, that's what I. Uh, that's a question I hear uh, quite uh, a few times every year. Uh, Roy, I think someone else than Reuters asked this question to me last year. But in a nutshell, everyone. Uh, is really willing that we sell. Uh, we are considering that as an investment vehicle. Uh, investment vehicle is giving us some yield. Um, the market of today is not uh, uh, that uh, is not really that good, so that we sell it uh, this year. But we do not exclude that at some point in time the market could be good enough, so that we use. Uh, that is an opportunity. I can tell you one thing. The investment is quite good. It spans across uh, like a few years from 2006 onwards, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Uh, from 2006 onward, uh, we have got 500 billion rubles uh, back. So uh, that's a significant amount. And uh, part of that is uh, uh, thanks to a uh, high share price. Uh, not only the dividend, but the dividend was uh, also significant, uh, nearly 50 billion rubles in total. So I'm considering that as a liquid instrument, managing our liquidity. Well, I keep in mind that this instrument is available, but um, I'm not thinking of it as available for sale. We need a more favorable market environment for this to happen. Thank you. Thanks. Our next question is coming from Mr. Alexei Novikov, Interfax. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, friends, colleagues. Uh, Mr. Sadigov, I have two questions. My first question relates uh, to uh, the tax agreement with the Netherlands. It's common knowledge that uh, Gazprom has huge assets in the Netherlands, like your cooperation holding. Does the group have any plans to reform uh, your ownership um, in the new tax environment? My other question is also tax related. The material package um, for the general shareholders meeting uh, suggests that the holding company could be uh, re-registered and moved over from the Moscow jurisdiction to the St. Pete jurisdiction. This has not been approved by the shareholders yet, so that's not a fact. But uh, given we only meet once a year, I would be very happy to hear your expert opinion on uh, whether uh, these payments of taxes to the budget of Moscow and to the budget of St. Pete would be different. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, let me start with the tax issue of the Netherlands. I have Mr. Karen Oganyan here, uh, so we'll be uh, happy to work together with him to answer your questions. Like say, uh, you, we haven't seen uh, each other for quite some time, so we need to meet more frequently. Uh, the tax uh, agreement with the Netherlands that has been denounced. Um, well, now we need to make decisions on our end. You have mentioned uh, uh, Gazprom Corporation holding, but in fact, uh, we have quite a few companies registered in the Netherlands. We're uh, working uh, on those to understand how to respond to the new challenges. Obviously, we would like to minimize our cash flows through the Netherlands, that's for sure. 
And secondly, and secondly, we need to use special economic uh, zones in uh, Kaliningrad or Ruski Island, and we'll see which one is more fitting, and we'll transfer some of our companies towards these jurisdictions. That is uh, still an early study exercise to understand the risks and uh, some of the additional costs. Of course, the costs are there, but minimizing these risks and minimizing our costs is an important issue. Once we have done the analysis, we'll make our decision, uh, and then again, we'll have no conflict between a to uh, tax authorities and uh, B, we're not going to pay a dual tax, of course. So by uh, the end of the year, we'll have all the decisions ready uh, in relation to that issue. It's not only about Gazprom Corporation holding, but also uh, Gazprom International. Gazpr Gazprom Corporation holding, uh, please be reminded that holding was established for the purpose of managing liquidity and doing the cash pooling. Decision has been made by now that a part of our foreign entities will um, connect to the cash pooling system directly. So that decision has been made already. It's in implementation phase. There is no particular need to establish a, a, a company in the Dutch jurisdiction. A few further companies have been created to implement a number of projects. Um, some of those will be uh, moved over to Russia, to the special economic areas. Uh, and Gazprom International is a major company uh, with uh, uh, various projects. Uh, we're considering how this could be moved to Russia as well. Your other question is about St. Pete. Okay. Well, that's a very clear question, of course. Um, that statement has been made, and now you're doing your maths on the taxes. It doesn't happen like that in real life. Um, it starts with a statement, then we uh, get down and choose the tax regime as a consolidated taxpayer. Then, depending on uh, the actual regime selected, we'll get more clarity as to which taxes uh, and where are to be paid. So we're going to con conclude that effort by the start of the new budgeting cycle, and namely by September 2021. That's when we start planning our budget for next year. And it's not only the budget, it's also the tax policy for Gazprom for 2022 and the two years to follow. That's when we uh, finally decide uh, on the numbers. Thank you. And if Mr. Ogunyan has anything to add, I do have something very briefly. Good afternoon, Alexei. Long time no see, indeed. Um, on the tax agreement denounced, well, uh, Mr. Sadigov has explained the situation. A quick uh, follow-up from my side. This did not uh, come out of the blue for us. This discussion has been on for quite some time, and we uh, calculated various response options that we had. So by the time this decision arrived and the president signed um, the bill, we had a clear understanding of our response so that we do not incur any financial losses. And that's on the tax agreement denunciation. And we're working to follow through on that plan. Uh, regarding your other question, again, a detailed response has been made by, uh, has been delivered by Mr. Sedegov. Uh, if that uh, transition is to happen, there will be more money to be paid to the budget of St. Petersburg. We have the calculation, we have the number, but it, I wouldn't want to uh, uh, announce it now because, as you hear from Mr. Sedegov, there will be quite a few drivers affecting it. We calculate many numbers, including the macro. Uh, amounts. Uh, if this decision is made, uh, further calculations will be uh, disclosed to the public. 
We are working uh, closely with the city of St. Petersburg, uh, and uh, we're in touch. Okay, our next question is coming from Denis Lebedev, Fontanka, St. Petersburg. Please go ahead. Yep. Um, actually, my question has been answered already. Thank you, colleagues. I uh, had the same question about St. Petersburg and the taxes to be paid here. Uh, let me try to uh, have a different question to you. What's the total tax payments to the Moscow budget across the group? Thank you. Okay, uh, the Moscow budget. Okay, let me answer that. So, in 2019, in 2019, we paid about 86 billion rubles into the budget of Moscow, and in 2020, it was uh, about 20 billion. Uh, the uh, reason for the number to be low is apparent. Thank you. Could we expect something of the same amount in St. Petersburg? I think I have answered your question to the previous uh, journalist. I don't think I can add for anything, anything further. And thank you very much for that. Thanks to you. OK, thank you. Our next question is coming from Angelina Glazova, JP Morgan. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to ask a question. Actually, most of my questions have been answered. I only have one question remaining. Uh, please uh, remind me of your CAPEX target for 2021 and the following years, if I may. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, here's my answer. Our budget uh, has 902 billion rubles of PGC Gazprom's CAPEX. It's pretty much flat year on year. Please be reminded, in 2020, we reduced our CAPEX by 20%. So our uh, CAPEX uh, this year is on par with the reduced budget of 2020. The original budget was 20 percent higher. Um, on the group level, we expect 1.5 to 1.6 trillion rubles before the end of the year. Um, that's the current outlook I can provide. It does represent an increase year on year first and foremost related to the gas infrastructure expansion program, which is going to be financed not with the new debt and not with EBITDA, but rather with perpetual bonds. Um, that's the current outlook uh, lasting until the end of the year. Now, uh, our expectations um, for the following years, well, um, Based on the results of the first half of the year, we normally adjust our budget and the CAPEX plan. This year is not going to be an exception. This adjustment is coming probably in September. The current market environment allows us to consider fast-tracking some of our projects on the gas side and uh, on the oil side of the, sec the business. Um, it's not about new projects, or it's not about expanding the scale of existing projects, but for some of the projects, uh, some of the projects could be moved over uh, from uh, the following years on to 2021. When cutting down on our capex earlier, part of the costs could be moved down the road towards the right. Uh, now, uh, some could be recovered back to where it was. Uh, and again, I'll be able to give you a more confident outlook once we have the numbers for the first six months. And again, our internal decision has been made that any additional uh, revenues, which will definitely be coming this year, an additional income will be split into three, um, 
three parts. One is about increasing the dividend. That has already been announced, and you've seen that. Second one is paying down the debt, which we have discussed at length uh, with you today. It may come down by 100 billion rubles on the borrowing plan. And uh, then potentially increase the capex as we move some of the costs from 2022 and following years into 2021. Uh, in case our EBITDA goes up, uh, and uh, that would bring more EBITDA faster. In 2022 and 2023, well, our budgeting cycle has already begun, but we are only looking at the macro numbers, balancing out the budget, some of the early volumes. I wouldn't want to give out any numbers uh, because I want to be substantiated by um, when the when we get closer to autumn this year, we'll have uh, some numbers that could be disclosed to you. Um, but given the crisis year of 2020, and given our current policy, it would be important for us to work on the numbers, taking into account very clearly the major principles we have. First and foremost, we are committed to paying our dividend fall in line with the dividend policy. Secondly, we would not like to increase our leverage, and uh, I would even say not increasing the total debt and probably reducing the total debt. And thirdly, in positive free cash flow. These are the three major pillars, and uh, based on those, we can proceed with planning our capex for the following years. Uh, that's our objective for two or three years to come. Thank you. Um, our next question is coming from Matvey Kutkov, Vedemist team. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Mr. Sedigov, I have a question about uh, the so-called additional gas infrastructure expansion program or the so-called uh, social uh, gas infrastructure expansion. Do you consider placing additional securities to finance that? And uh, my other question relates to the share price. Uh, do you have any minimal share price target below which you can't go? And if there is any plan to increase the market cap, if so, what's the plan? And my third question is about your green bonds. Would you like to place any? If so, what could be the timeline and what could be the volume? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Matvey, uh, these are rather exciting questions. I think I have explained the additional issue. Frankly, I don't understand why these questions come up, not only from you, Matvey, but uh, I hear the same from other people. Frankly speaking, uh, there may be discussions elsewhere, but not within Gazprom. It could not even occur to us. Uh, the gas infrastructure expansion plan is nothing new. It has been around in the previous five years. For the upcoming five years, we have a uh, cost of 526 billion in total. That's in rubles. Divide that by five, you'll get 105. Is uh, that any major number? No, that's a growth of only 25 to 30 billion year on year. Would we need an additional issue? No, no need. We do not intend to issue any new securities for that. Someone has asked this question, I think, um, whether preference shares could be issued, could be placed. in order to finance the gas infrastructure expansion plan? No, that's not our target at all. For year one of the program, uh, we have decided uh, not to use our EBITDA and not to bring in any additional debt, but that's based on our experience of last year. Um, in the following years, We'll see. Should our EBITDA suffice, we'll be paying from the EBITDA. If we need to manage it somehow, we'll take a closer look at it once we get there, because we want to manage our debt first and foremost rather than anything else. Um, now, uh, the share price uh, target at the year end. Matvey, you know, I uh, hope you're not asking this because you want to manage your personal investments. Um, I believe uh, you need to have 
analysts hired and uh, you need to be paying to them. I, I really can't say that to you because that's insider information. Uh, so I'm not going to say anything to you. I hope you don't take that as offense. Um, now the green bonds. Um, well, yes, we did have these plans and I commented on that last year. Gazprom is very responsible about that step. Calling a green bond, which is not effectively green, as some companies have done, is a reputational risk for us, so we do not intend to do so. We are prepping, we are considering other issues uh, this year, not last year. So uh, we have decided to consider it. In my presentation, I mentioned that uh, one of our principles is uh, about ESG, right? We're working towards ESG, so we're seriously looking into that matter. We have brought in advisors on that subject. We would like to have uh, ESG-linked bonds, not only green bonds, but ESG bonds. So uh, that effort is underway. If um, we look at the market and see an opportunity this year, we'll um, do it this year, but most likely uh, next year, I believe we need to come up with a good strategy first, get it trusted, not only with some 2050 KPIs, but uh, also some of the uh, strategy for the upcoming years. Um, once we have the KPIs in line with this current strategy, um, then we need to work with investors and uh, think how we uh, set up an issue next year. Uh, on top of that, we have the possibility to launch ruble bonds, which are also green because we have a national project called Environment. Um, So when we work on our investment program for the following years, we uh, will be looking at that. We have brought in advisors, the banks, who are working uh, on the same program for the following year. OK, thank you, Mr. Sudegov, and thank you, Matvey. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Ms. Media, Anastasia Goriva. Please go ahead. Good afternoon. I have a few questions uh, to uh, understand project financing. You have mentioned that project financing for Simakovsky and the second phase of uh, Yuzhnaruski field. Would that mean a 70 by 30 split, 30 percent equity, 70 percent project financing, or is, is that any different? Question, Simakovsky and Yuzhnaruski, yes, it's 30 to 70 split, and I think it's 20 to 80. For Simakovsky, as uh, my colleagues are advising, and the the last days of the uh, transactions, we have managed to hit 20% equity, 80% project financing. So we have managed to do so. As to uh, uh well, these need to be added together. So if you have everything combined, because that was uh, step one and step two, that, that would be 30 to 70 because that's the general number, 30 to 70 split. OK, that's understood. And another quick question. You have mentioned that some Gazprom field, without mentioning the name, uh, some Gazprom field with no partners will uh, have a project financing exercise set up. What particular field are we talking about? I said, really? Yes, today, just now. You have mentioned a number of fields. But uh, those fields you have mentioned have partners like Legorska. Yeah, yeah, understood. I get your question. Indeed, as we bring project financing, we try uh, to make sure there is no recourse to our balance sheet for obvious reasons, or at least it would have minimal recourse. 
Managing our leverage is a very important element. That's why. So that's our objective. As we bring in strategic investors, um, that would be a classical example of such a project. We are considering a financing of our traditional fields with uh, no partners. I can give you the case of Harasavayske field, where we do intend to bring in project financing. We're going to manage uh, the impact on our balance sheet to make sure it's as low as possible. And we could bring in uh, financial investors rather than strategic investors. Uh, if not, then we'll have project financing with uh, recourse to our balance sheet, but for the full amount of the project, for the full time of the project. We have quite a few of those projects, and listing all of them would take a while. If need be, you, my colleagues will be happy to share the full list with you, and it's quite a long list of smaller projects which we are working on right now. Question then, when could you make the decision to bring project financing for Harasavayske field? Um, decision, well, we have started looking into that this year. Uh, we have not brought in any official like financial advisors. We have asked a few banks for opinion. We are suggesting varying parameters, so we'll be uh, looking closer at that. and then we'll decide how we proceed. And then um, a question about the Ringoisky field with Lukoil. Do you have any understanding of the amount of project financing, the timeline? Yes, uh, we have just signed up. We're setting up the project company, and uh, then it would further take the process down to investment decision making. Then we have financial advisors uh, joining in who will be sourcing their financial model, and then it will proceed to implementation phase. Question How about touching of deposits? Uh, number four, number five, uh, with uh, uh, Winters Halle. Yeah, uh, we are in a more advanced stage with Winters Halle. Financial advisors have already been brought in. They suggest uh, closing the transaction by the end of next year. I'm uh, pushing uh, them to make it happen in the first six months. That's the current status. Question, is that the same 70 to 30 split? 70% project financing, 30% equity? Answer, yes, exactly. 70% project financing, 30% equity with our partners, contributed with our partners, of course. OK, thank you. Uh, colleagues, we have been with you for um, eight, 80 minutes now. Everyone has asked their questions. Um, I believe I think we we have time for two questions, uh, like Mr. Alexei Novikov has a follow-up, and then uh, one question from Ria Novistim. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Snegov, I have a follow-up question. You have mentioned that Gazprom is working on a strategy. Are you talking about uh, the 2050 sustainable development scenarios? Uh, mentioned previously by uh, Mr. Aksutin, or any other development strategy which we haven't heard of previously and now it's going to happen. Could you clarify, please? Thank you. Well, uh, first we approve the scenarios, and then based on the scenarios, we'll approve the strategy. I have made no mistake. We're talking about a new strategy. To make sure that investors trust us, we need to uh, understand the strategy, set up the KPIs, and keep going, keep pushing for those. That's our target. What's uh, the timeline here? Um, 2050, the same? Um, 20 plus 50, I would say, uh, as everyone else does. 
We're now looking at what our colleagues are suggesting. They have a few stages in their development strategy. Some are talking about 20, uh, 10 plus 20. Some are talking about 20 uh, dash 50. We'll see what's uh, perceived better by the investment community. Based on these KPIs, um, well, there have been um, recent issues with a few oil and gas companies doing that. So we're now looking at um, what they are. they are doing based on our needs, among other things, and our capabilities. Thank you. I'm going to uh, read the last question then. Um, Ria Novosti has sent it. Unfortunately, they were not able to um, be part of this press conference, but they have asked us to uh, get the question answered. Uh, when is the LTI plan for the management team going to be approved, and what are the key provisions? Thank you. Uh, We intend to uh, develop that program, as I mentioned last year. This has been developed. We have brought in quite a few investors and analysts to contribute to the program. We asked for opinions from various banks. So we are working on that internally to have it approved by the Board of Directors this year. I don't think I can give you any numbers at this point in time. Before we get to the board meeting in autumn, uh, once we have the approval from the management committee, I'll be happy to discuss some of the metrics with you. Uh, but uh, frankly speaking, that LTI plan is quite good, as uh, mentioned by many stakeholders. But we'll get back to you on that in the future. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, this concludes our press conference. We appreciate uh, you taking part. Thank you so very much, colleagues. Uh, it's very much unfortunate uh, we have to look at each other through the screen. I really hope that next time we meet, there will be no COVID. It will be gone because I really need your response. When I only see small images, uh, we don't actually perceive the response. And it's uh, much more challenging to understand whether the dialogue is good or not. I have tried answering all of your questions today. So I uh, hope you have got all your questions. If not, then I'll try to be uh, even more precise and even more specific next time. Thank you very much. I'll see you next time and uh, stay safe. Cheers.